Hitler's control over Germany is built on a simple illusion. People believe the Führer is an all-wise genius, leading them in a noble enterprise. But now the reality is breaking through. Germany is losing the war. Appalling atrocities are being committed. And Hitler is increasingly out of touch. It's a man who's breaking down, physically and mentally. As some Germans learn the truth, they start to plot against the regime. If you're caught, you know fully well that you're going to end up having your head chopped off or strung up by piano wire. This is the story of how the Nazi illusion starts to crack. And Hitler will do anything to cling to power. By the winter of 1943, it's all going wrong for Adolf Hitler. After the defeat at Stalingrad, Hitler's army is suffering disaster after disaster. In Italy, his closest ally Mussolini, the fascist dictator, has been overthrown. In the West, the threat of a massive Allied invasion is growing daily. Germany itself is now a target. Relentless bombing raids leave thousands homeless. These were people who for 12 years have been told the Führer can do no wrong. Germany cannot err under him, almost an infallibility about it. The public image of an all-conquering military genius is no longer believable. What the German people don't know is that their beloved Führer is falling apart. He's living on a cocktail of drugs. He's taking strychnine, which his doctor prepares for him. He sleeps less than three hours a night. He's seeing cocaine, having injected to keep him going. He's now secretly cracking up. Out of contact with his people, he spends all his time at his remote headquarters in the east, trying to turn around the course of the war. All this presents a real problem for the Nazis' master of spin, Joseph Goebbels. Since the beginning, he has been the architect of the key to Nazi success the presentation of the Führer's image as the all-wise statesman. To keep in touch with what's being said about Hitler in the bars and cafes across Germany, he uses thousands of spies to eavesdrop on people's conversations. Goebbels was a pioneer in terms of research, polling public opinion to shape your messaging. Um, is, is, is clearly one of the most um, powerful elements of anybody generating power now. The latest reports make disturbing reading for Goebbels. Many Germans are starting to feel that Hitler is out of touch with their daily suffering. He has withdrawn from public appearance his broadcasts are very few and far between. There is a risk that the German people are losing faith in their leader. And that's what Goebbels says to him, that, mein Führer, we need leadership. We, we, greatness can't just exist in, the, in a vacuum. It's got to be expressed somehow. Keen to turn the situation around, Goebbels resorts to the power of mass media to rally support for the Führer. In April, he has the perfect opportunity, Hitler's 55th birthday. In 
In Nazi folklore, Hitler's birthday was a very special day. And so in 1944, Goebbels was very keen that the tradition of a great celebration should be continued. He makes sure the newsreels carry the story across Germany. The message is that even when their cities are being bombed and their houses collapse, the German people will stand firm alongside their Führer. They, they were going through hard times. Bombing were almost, was almost a daily or nightly affair. How do you survive that? How do you sustain yourself? Belief and hope. And that's what the message is, is meant to convey. We will come through. Goebbels' propaganda even makes a virtue out of Hitler spending so much time with his generals. The Führer's duty, he says, is to win the war for the German nation. It may mean he has less time for the people, but they owe him their loyalty because he is fighting tirelessly for them. But both Goebbels and Hitler are unaware he is already fatally out of touch with one section of his people, vital to the Nazis' survival. The army. The biggest danger to the Nazi regime is brewing out on the front line amongst middle-ranking officers. These are the people who see the gulf between Hitler's claims as a leader and the reality in the field. The colonels, the, the middle ranking, middle management of the army, they were the people who were actually out on the ground realizing what he'd got them into. They have to follow Hitler's increasingly bizarre orders from his total ban on any German retreat. Absurd strategically, absurd militarily, as his generals knew to his reckless demands for offensives without adequate troops or equipment. Among those who've experienced this chaos is Lieutenant Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg. A war hero, he has lost an eye and a hand in battle. As a soldier and an aristocrat, he is outraged by Hitler's military incompetence. When the war goes wrong from 42, really post uh, Stalingrad, one can understand why the Stauffenbergs of this world found Hitler increasingly impossible to accept. As a staunch Catholic, Stauffenberg is also horrified by the Nazis' treatment of the Jews. With the Fuhrer in charge, he believes his beloved Germany is heading for disaster. It could soon be wiped off the map by its enemies. Stauffenberg's treasonous views are shared by fellow officer Colonel Henning von Tresco. He too is appalled by the evil reality the Nazis are trying to hide. The slaughter of thousands of civilians in Poland and the Soviet Union. He finds it hard to reconcile that with his sense of being a soldier and being a decent German. These men are the first to realize the sick nature of the regime beneath the public gloss. They're desperate to save Germany and salvage its military honor, but they can't do it with the Fuhrer in charge. They have only one option, to kill Hitler. The risks are immense because if you're caught, you know fully well that you're going to end up having your head chopped off or strung up by piano wire. Hitler has some of the most sophisticated personal security. He changes his itinerary often. He has very trusted SS men surrounding him who guard him. Von Tresco is undeterred he sets up several attempts on Hitler's life. Hitler is the luck of the devil. He changes his itinerary at the last minute, so someone who's about to shoot him you know, misses his chance. Um, you know, bombs are placed near him, but they don't go off.
Increasingly, von Tresco realizes killing Hitler is not enough. To defeat the Nazis utterly, he needs to decapitate the entire Reich. He has to mount a coup d'etat. He has a real sense of history and the importance, the historical importance, of what they're doing. And he says this on a number of occasions. Um, there's one famous quote where he says that the stain of Nazism will, will affect us all, uh, you know, for generations to come. Uh, and he says, it will not be Hitler who is blamed only. It will be you and me, it will be your wife and my wife, my children and your children. And he sees that most, you know, ab with absolute uh, clarity. Meanwhile, the regime that prides itself on being loved by its people has no idea that someone is plotting its downfall. Adolf Hitler is increasingly out of touch with his people. He spends weeks in his remote headquarters, the Wolf's Lair, trying to turn around a war that cannot be won. He doesn't see the signs of discontent that are stirring. Two army officers, Klaus von Stauffenberg and Henning von Tresco, are sickened by the horrors being carried out in the name of the German people. So they're plotting to overthrow the regime. It wasn't enough for them simply to, to, to kill the head of state uh, and then let, let chaos reign. They had to have some contingency plan to take power. They could then negotiate with, with Germany's enemies. The solution they come up with is astonishing. They will get the Nazi state to overthrow itself. They will hijack Operation Valkyrie. Operation Valkyrie is the Nazis' top-secret plan to crush any uprising within Germany. At this stage, the Nazis see the biggest threat coming from the millions of foreign slave laborers they have shipped in to boost Germany's war effort. Living in appalling conditions and deeply resentful, they are a potential enemy within. Valkyrie starts with the idea, we have to do something that prevents the problems within from growing to such an extent, they become a threat to the state itself. Any workers' uprising would trigger Operation Valkyrie, mobilizing troops from the Nazis' reserve army controlled from Berlin. These are regular fighting units based in Germany as reinforcements for the front line. If Valkyrie is launched, their role is to seize key control centers and suppress any internal uprising. By a stroke of luck for the conspirators, the man put in charge of the Valkyrie plans is none other than Colonel von Stauffenberg. Secretly, he and his fellow plotter, Henning von Tresco, decide to modify the orders. They realized that this was a plan that could be uh, tweaked and subverted to actually serve the purposes of, of the plotters. Their changes to the Valkyrie orders need to be discreetly typed up without anyone being able to trace who made them. Von Tresco's wife joins the plotters. They know there is one force in particular they will have to deal with. The SS, the elite troops fanatically loyal to Hitler and the Nazi regime. So, alongside the original orders to suppress any uprising of foreign workers, the plotters secretly add the SS as a potential threat to Germany. They, too, will now be neutralized by the reserve army. Their plan needs one final element, 
an excuse to launch Valkyrie. Rather than wait for a workers' uprising, they add their own trigger. The assassination of the Führer. The plotters now have a plan ready to seize power. What they have to do next is find a way to kill Hitler. The key problem is how to gain access to him and his inner circle. Hitler appears very rarely in public and never gives his details of movement, so you couldn't plan to assassinate him in the open. It's just not on. It has to be done, really, at some military gathering. As the plotters ponder this challenge, a long-awaited event adds urgency to their plans. D-Day. The Allied invasion in the West is finally launched. As the scale of the invasion becomes clear, the German commanders are desperate to unleash a counterattack using their panzer divisions. But for that, they need the permission of their supreme commander, Adolf Hitler. It's remarkable that he has that degree of control over the military. They couldn't act on their own. But the supreme commander is hundreds of miles away at his mountain retreat in Bavaria. He's been celebrating the wedding of the sister of his companion, Ava Braun. Now he is sleeping it off, and he's given orders not to be woken before noon. So while the panzers wait for the Führer, valuable hours are lost, allowing the Allies to secure their beachheads in Normandy. And very soon, there's more bad news. In the east, the Soviets launch a devastating offensive. Two million troops tear through the German lines, inflicting some half a million casualties. There's a real danger. Germany itself could soon be overrun and destroyed completely. This gives a, uh, an added urgency to the plotters to, to make a final effort to, to salvage something from the, from the wreckage of Nazi Germany. Among those out east trying to stop the Soviet advance is Henning von Tresco. He calls on his fellow plotters to act. What matters now is to prove to the world and for the records of history that the men of the resistance movement dared to take the decisive step. The next move is now up to Colonel von Stauffenberg. And in the midst of these dramatic events, he is summoned to Hitler's residence in the Alps. He has been given the task of briefing him on Operation Valkyrie, the regime's secret internal security plans. The invitation to see Hitler in Bavaria is a breakthrough for the plotters. They now have access to the heart of the Nazi regime. And the first meeting that he has with Hitler is, is actually on the 7th of June 1944, which is the day after D-Day. He shook hands with, with uh, Stauffenberg and, and sort of held his gaze for a, a while, as he tended to do, which was his way of sort of uh, testing somebody out to see what their metal was like. Hitler senses no threat and welcomes him in. Now, Stauffenberg has what he wants, regular access to the Führer. He couldn't have hoped for better in terms of, if I'm going to get at the man, I've got to be physically close to him. And here's the chance. By early July, Stauffenberg is ready to assassinate the Führer and so trigger Valkyrie. He decides to use one of his now regular meetings with Hitler to make his move. But for the conspirators' plan to work, they don't just want the Führer. 
They need to take out as many high-ranking Nazis as possible. So Stauffenberg delays, waiting for a time he can catch them all together. A week later, he thinks he has that moment. He has been summoned back to Hitler's residence in Bavaria. But when he gets there, Himmler, the head of the SS, is absent. Stauffenberg aborts the mission. Four days later, he has another chance. Hitler is now at the Wolf's Lair, his remote headquarters in the east. It was an enormous installation, um, something like 200 buildings. It had three concentric rings of security. Each one had to have a specific type of pass to get through. So security was absolutely as tight as was, was possible. And for anyone going in there, um, it would be quite a daunting experience. You're going into the very inner sanctum of the Third Reich. Again, key members of the Nazis' inner circle are absent. Stauffenberg aborts the mission once more. With the Allies closing in, time is now running out for the conspirators. They must strike soon. What's crucial for the progress of the plot is the idea that Hitler has been killed. Um, this is the thought, it's almost like a magic spell that people imagined that uh, if, if Hitler was, was thought to be dead, that then uh, not only the sense of personal loyalty that many soldiers had to him would, would be considered to have lapsed, but also there's almost like a, you know, Hitler had a, such a, uh, a presence that once that had gone, that people could perhaps think more freely. The plotters have been secretly building a small network of like-minded collaborators, ready to make their move once Hitler is gone. But the wider the circle grows, the greater the risk that someone will betray them before they can strike. After several abortive attempts, Stauffenberg decides it is now or never. He flies from Berlin to Hitler's remote headquarters in the east, the Wolf's Lair. He is accompanied by his adjutant, who will help him prepare the bomb. Let's not forget, you are right at the heart of power in Nazi Germany, and you are about to kill Adolf Hitler, who is regarded as a saint uh, still by so many people. Um, this is a huge event, and you, know, you could just imagine what's going through his head. First, he finds a room in one of the outer buildings where they can set the fuse. It contains a glass vial of acid and a spring-loaded detonator. One twist releases the acid. It gives him just over 10 minutes to plant the bomb and get away. He now sets off for Hitler's briefing room. The sheer stress of trying to carry out that assassination, it was something you only did once. And yet Stauffenberg had already carried his bomb into a number of meetings with Hitler, and he'd already been down that road a number of times. So you can only imagine what degree of stress he must have been under. Neither Himmler nor Goering is there, but he decides there is no way back. Briefcase gets put down, it's basically a ticking bomb, Hitler is surely going to die. Stauffenberg makes the excuse he has to take a phone call and leaves. Convinced the deed is done, Stauffenberg rushes back to Berlin to launch the coup against the Nazis.
But what he doesn't know is that Hitler survives. When the news reaches Berlin, the coup swiftly unravels. Four of the ringleaders, including Klaus von Stauffenberg, are immediately executed. Uh, only Stauffenberg made any comment as he, as he was about to be shot. He, he cried out, uh, long live holy Germany. And those were his last words. Out on the Eastern Front, von Tresco hears that the plot has failed and commits suicide. He was subsequently given a hero's funeral as a great colonel on the, on the Eastern Front. Um, but in time, his role inevitably, and as he predicted, uh, his role in the wider plot is uncovered, uh, and his corpse is actually exhumed and, uh, and cremated in Sachsenhausen concentration camp. Hitler may have survived, but this is still a real crisis for the Nazis. Their entire regime is built on the idea that the German people adore him. So how do you explain it when the people who should be the most loyal to him, the military, try to kill him? This is the new challenge that lands on the desk of propaganda chief Joseph Goebbels. The solution he adopts is the tried and tested tactic that has brought the Nazis so much success in the past. In public, he will continue to project the image of the Fuhrer as the popular, caring statesman. He is filmed looking fit and well, visiting those wounded by the bomb. He's had a lucky escape. Four of his men have died. Goebbels says, his survival is another sign of his great destiny. The providential hand of fate upon his shoulder, he has come through. Even his closest people can't bring him down. Why has he survived? To lead Germany to victory. Goebbels' next step is to downplay the conspiracy. He advises Hitler to go on air to make it clear the plotters don't represent ordinary German people. This is a crime without parallel in German history. A plot forged by a tiny clique of ambitious, criminal, stupid officers. The message is that the Fuhrer is still popular. Just a tiny fringe is against him. He rejects his, uh, his would-be assassins as a group of adventurers, a military clique trying to take power. So what Hitler is doing is, is appealing over their heads to the people and saying, I have survived, I am still here, I'm still with you. To ram his message home, Hitler promises vengeance. This tiny gang of criminals will be mercilessly eradicated. This is the Nazis' next move a campaign of terror. The man in charge is Heinrich Himmler, overall head of the security services. He unleashes the SS and the Gestapo. 7,000 people are arrested throughout Germany. The crackdown makes it clear to anyone thinking subversive thoughts what might happen to them. It justifies increasing severity, increasing surveillance, Increasing brutality. Himmler even targets their wives and children. Many are dispatched to concentration camps. The brutality of the Gestapo and the SS isn't accidental. It's programmed into the whole machinery of Nazi rule. You have to be brutal to those who can or do represent a potential threat. To cap it all, they are going to put the plotters into a public show trial. It would have been very easy simply for the conspirators or the suspected conspirators just to have disappeared in the Nazi phrase into night and fog, uh, ultimately there to get a bullet in the back of their heads in a concentration camp. But what Hitler wanted to do was to put these people on trial or some of them on trial and so they went to these things called the People's Court. Hitler's aim is to have the conspirators publicly humiliated. They are brought before the court 
stripped of any military dignity. And one of the most sort of raving demonic judges associated with these courts was a man called Roland Freisler, um, who would literally scream and shout at the accused. I mean, this was not impartial justice. He would scream and shout at the accused. I mean, sometimes so loud that those actually recording uh, these so-called trials for posterity would actually ask him to keep his volume down for the sake of the microphones. Goebbels makes sure that the journalists report every humiliating encounter. There can be no doubt what happens to those who betray the Reich. This is not a judge. This is simply an executioner in a robe. Some 5,000 are condemned to be executed. Hitler says he wants them hung up like meat carcasses. Some executions are even filmed and sent back for Hitler and the SS to watch. The regime also moved quite quickly to shore up its authority amongst the military. So, for example, the Hitler greeting, uh, which wasn't until that point required, became required of, of all military personnel uh, after the 20th of July. And all uh, Wehrmacht personnel, right from, from field marshals down to the lowliest private, were required yet again to personally declare their loyalty uh, to Adolf Hitler. The Nazi party's strategy Fierce repression and an aggrieved sense of betrayal seems to work. Goebbels' reports from the secret police reveal an upsurge of support for the Führer. And people said, what, what criminals are they that can bring down the Führer? Um, the, the general feeling, as recorded, is that although people might have been unhappy with the war, the way it was going, and Hitler's role, the idea that somebody tried to destroy the Führer kill the Fuhrer in this way. That does quieten quite a few sceptical voices that were being heard prior to that. But the regime does face one particular public relations challenge. Field Marshal Erwin Rommel is a hero to the German people and one of Hitler's favorite commanders. But in the interrogations, his name is mentioned as one of those involved in the conspiracy. Rommel certainly seems to have been approached by the plotters and seems to have been sounded out. Uh, and there's, I think, convincing evidence that he would have signed up to the idea of Hitler being removed, but he certainly wouldn't have uh, countenanced an assassination. That, I think, is, is a step too far. That would, that would not have uh, been something that he would have considered acceptable or, or desirable. So some sort of change at the top to, to rationalise the German military effort would be something that he potentially might have, might have been uh, amenable to. However deep his involvement, Rommel is now a problem for the Nazis. Rommel's association with the conspiracy is a really tricky one for the Nazis to play out. If he's against the Nazis, well then, frankly, who shouldn't be? If he is put on trial, um, a massive hero like that is going to be a really bad PR disaster. But once his name comes up, the regime has to act. Himmler's solution is brutal but it must be made to look respectable. Two months after the assassination attempt, Rommel is at home, recovering from injuries suffered in an Allied air attack. One day, two officers turn up at his home. and they come into the house and they have this very brief conversation in which his options are given to him. He's either going to kill himself and his family will be safe, or he uh, will have to be uh, put on trial. Faced with this appalling choice, 
He takes the only option he can as a husband and father. He does what the regime wants. He takes the poison and commits suicide. The official line is that Rommel died from his war injuries. Hitler cynically orders a grand military funeral for his popular hero. He even sends flowers to Rommel's wife. But the family know the bitter truth. It captures very nicely the idea of kind of what's going on in private in the Nazi regime and what's going on in public in the Nazi regime. In the, in the private world, you've got basically all this hostility, all these undercurrents of treachery, both you know, against the regime and by the regime against their own generals. And yet in public, everything seems hunky-dory. You've got state funerals of Rommel, swastikas on the coffin, honor guards, you know, public eulogies in praise of him. But only the illusion of normality has been restored. Germany is still losing the war, and people are still losing faith in the Fuhrer. Goebbels needs to pull the nation together once more behind Adolf Hitler. So he repeats the call he made a year earlier for total war. Everyone, men, women, and children, are to be mobilized to save Germany. Some people claim the German nation is resisting the government's total war measures. The Germans don't want total war, say the English. They want capitulation. So do you want total war? He said, we need to go back to the party and to the people. I think we can see the practical outcome of this in the calling up of young boys and older men for military service. But in reality, it's an act of desperation. These young lads and these older men had few modern weapons, the old men had military training, the young boys didn't. They clearly were, to any rational mind, were not going to be a match for well-equipped American or Soviet or British troops. But Goebbels invested a kind of myth mythological belief in them as embodying the spirit of the people, the spirit of the party. At the time, Goebbels' appeal does work. It makes it look to the German people that something is happening. But this illusion will not last unless the Führer can restore his reputation as a great military leader. So, in his drug-crazed state, he plans a last desperate gamble a top-secret offensive to defeat the Allies in the West with one huge knockout blow. By the autumn of 1944, Hitler has few military options. The Allies are tightening the vice around Germany. Aware that support at home is ebbing away, Hitler decides to seize the initiative. He can't, Germany can't survive for very long. There's got to be one last great victory somewhere. Working day and night, he searches for weakness in his enemies. And finally, he thinks he finds one. Since D-Day, the Allies have been pushing through France, but their advance has left them vulnerable. All their supplies and reinforcements have to be shipped in from Britain. And the most important port for the Allies is Antwerp in Belgium. Everything comes through from Antwerp. It is absolutely vital. 
cut the supply lines from Antwerp and the Allies will grind to a halt, making them easy prey for Hitler's army. His idea is to drive a wedge between the British and Americans to repeat the Blitzkrieg success of 1940, potentially to throw the British back into the sea. Hitler then identifies just the place to make his push, through the heavily wooded area of the Ardennes, the same place he had launched his attack on France four years earlier. It is now only lightly defended by American troops. And he sees that bulge through the Ardennes region where the Allies have overexposed themselves. He said, that's our salvation. If his panzers can pierce the line here, he could split the British and American allies, cut them off from the coast and seize the port of Antwerp. So he assembles his entire strategic reserve. Some 300,000 men, over 2,000 tanks, armored vehicles and assault guns. He's convinced this plan will restore his power over Germany. And if it doesn't work, there's nothing to fall back on. There literally is, is nothing left in military terms if Ar the Ardennes campaign fails. It's a massive gamble, an all or nothing throw on one last lightning offensive. Every gambler knows that the longer you stay at the table, the more chances you have of losing all your money. And that's what Hitler's like. He's like the worst gambler. The odds against him are enormous. His panzers don't have enough fuel to reach Antwerp. They'll have to capture American supplies. And in the air, the Luftwaffe's remaining fighters face almost total Allied supremacy. But Hitler's sure he's right. He tells Goebbels it's the only way forward. The two of them stay talking together into the early hours of the morning, kindling up together a vision of this great victory, reinvoking the spirit of 1940 when they had experienced these lightning successes. To deliver his victory, Hitler summons the field marshals he still trusts. Von Rundstedt, the master strategist who has never been defeated in battle. And Walter Mördel, a committed Nazi known as the Führer's fireman because he never lets down his leader in a crisis. But when they hear about the plan, they're nervous. The risk that they see in the Ardennes Offensive is that it's the last throw of the dice. They're assembling everything that they've got to throw at the Allies, and if it doesn't work, that's it. There's nothing left in the, in the armory. In fact, von Rundstedt doesn't want to be involved at all. He's well aware of Hitler's limitations as a strategist. He finds a way to sit out the battle. He feigned some stomach complaint. Uh, he was sick, he was unwell, he had ulcer perhaps. He, he tried to suggest that it'd better if someone else did the planning of that part of the campaign because he didn't feel, he wasn't confident that he could go through with it. He didn't think it would work. But there is one elite force that Hitler can still rely on. The fanatical Nazis of the Waffen-SS. They were men you could still trust. The waffen -S, the last good Germans left, the last great military force to save the nation. The lead element in the Ardennes Offensive is the 6th SS Panzer Army, commanded by um, Sepp Dietrich, uh, an SS Colonel General, who is effectively an old drinking buddy of Hitler's. Dietrich has stood by Hitler since the 1920s, from the early days as his bodyguard to fighting his fiercest battles. He was somebody who had always got things done for Hitler, uh, and I think at that stage, uh, Hitler was clutching at straws. 
Preparations continue in the utmost secrecy. There must be no sign of the coming attack. The name of the operation was, was Operation Watch on the Rhine, which had a strong defensive connotation. The Allies knew uh, through signals intercepts that, that German troops were being massed uh, in northwest Germany, but they didn't appreciate what it was for. They, they thought, thought it was some sort of redeployment to, to establish a defensive line. Hitler bans all radio communication. Surprise will be crucial. In the early hours, just before Christmas, the attack begins. The panzers surge through the American front lines. Bad weather protects them from Allied air attack. At first, the Americans don't know what has hit them. In the south, the panzers advance over 50 miles. After two days, Hitler's gamble still seems to be paying off. Back home, Goebbels is desperate to see how news of the attack will affect public opinion. His headlines make it clear how much is at stake. In fact, the early reports from the secret police reveal Hitler's plan is working. People are falling in behind the Fuhrer. They are deeply joyous that we have again gained the initiative, especially since no one had expected that. But the Allies regroup quicker than Hitler expects. The advance is checked. The German war machine runs out of fuel. Soon after Christmas, Hitler has to accept the grim reality. His last throw of the dice has failed. There is now no hope that the war can be won.